coming to you from North Atlanta Studios and brought to you by Mesmerize Media. It's the Advantage of Adversity podcast. And now, here's your host, Glenn Carver. Hello, I'm Glenn Carver, your host for the Advantage of Adversity podcast. And the mission of this podcast is to bring to you amazing people with inspiring stories who have dealt with significant adversity either in their personal or professional life. And they not only chose to find the advantage in the adversity, but maybe they even found some opportunity in the adversity. And today I've got a, an amazing guest on, Mr. Kit Cummings. I'll, uh, I'll be uh, open about it. We're longtime friends. He's like, a, he's like a brother to me. We met back in the day at UGA, so I had to sport my, my Go Dog shirt today, Kit. But uh, Kit, Kit's story is just absolutely amazing. And um, his, uh, his, his resume is amazing. And you're going to hear a lot about what he's done in his life. And this, I think this conversation is going to have two chapters in it. Chapter one is, Kid is the self-anointed uh, fallen drunk preacher. So I can't wait to hear that story. There's some humility there, I'm sure. And then uh, part two is, in 2010, he started, he founded the, the Power of Peace Project. And um, you have ministered in uh, over 100 prisons worldwide. You've brought your message of peace and hope and programs and curriculum to 10,000 inmates. And uh, just it's just mind-boggling. And I, I was saying to myself this morning as I was preparing for this kit, even if I didn't like you and I love you like a brother, I would be blown away by your story, what you're doing. And to me, you're not only a, friend, a great friend, I respect you, I looked up to you, I admire your work, but I think you're a modern-day Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela. So Welcome to Advantage of Adversity. Like you said, man, we go back. You know what I'm saying? We're not going to tell those things. No, no, no. I thought we'd be vulnerable, bro. Yeah, I just thought would be totally vulnerable. No, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. I'm honored. I'm very, I respect you. You know that. I admire you. And this, oh, thank you. Perfect for you. Built okay. for this. And so I'm, I'm glad to be here. Glad to have you. So let's just, let's, let's roll. The, the, the fallen, drunken preacher. So when did you... When did you get the call, the nudge to preach, to get into the church? Did you come from a family of preachers? What happened for Kit Cummings back in the day, and when was that? Drunk and fallen preacher. <laughs> um, I was the least likely guy to become. Like, we were hanging back in the day at UGA. Did you see me, you know, preaching? Uh, no, I'd be an oxymoron. <laughs> nice, exactly. And so, you know, I mean, addiction runs through my family. Mental illness as well. And a lot of people have been touched by that. It's a big talk in the world today. And uh, God bless my dad, he never kicked it. Right around the time you and I were meeting, he passed, you know, so when I was in college. And so, you know, I come by it honest. Um, I got one speed, this all out. Right. You know, two's good, six is better. W, I call it WFO. <laughs> Wide freaking open. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know that. That's why we hunk. And so um, I knew growing up that, shoot, it, in, in high school, I was drinking alcoholic and then drugs too. And then UGA was a blur, but everybody did it. You know what I'm saying? And it, it just was what we did. But then I got out and, you know, got into the music business for a minute. And it just, every level of life, my partying kept increasing. So by the time I'm, you know, 23, 24, my dad had passed. I, I'm not even, at that point, I know I'm an, like, I've gone, I, I went. So you weren't in denial. No. Not at all. I, you know, I went to an AA meeting, you know, when I was 20 after I crashed into the car. That's what I do. And um, and so, you know, I was just kind of beaten into a state of reasonableness and, and ready for a change. And we don't know when that's coming. You know, I, I quit drinking for a couple of months, you know what I'm saying? But I'm just kind of hope. Um, And I go and I decide I'm going to get in shape. I go and start playing basketball down at the Y. And, uh, you know, I'm like everybody else with cussing and sweating and uh, fighting. And there's one dude, and he, the best way I can describe it is he just had a shine to him. Mm -hmm. Good athlete, headed him. Always remember my name, and I, I never remembered it. And so he intrigued me, and so one day I followed him to the water fountain. I was like, what's up with you? And he's like, what do you mean? I said, what do you do? And he said, I'm a minister. And I said, because I didn't know any. You asked me, did I grow up this way? Right, no. I didn't go to church. I didn't read the book. I didn't hang out with the, the good kids. You know right. what I'm saying? My family raised me right. I just didn't choose right. You know what I'm saying? I always liked being on the edge. I was that kid. Dare me to do something, I'll do it. Sure. You know, that guy. Sure. And I also kind of you know, was a, a leader and an athlete. And so, you know. And so that, that guy, 
you know, but he, he changed my life. And I, I said, man, where's your church? And I showed up and I was like, man, stay the Bible with me. Did. And I was like, dude, so nine months after, and this goes along with, I only got one speed. I'm like, I had fallen head over heels in love with God and just been like, whoa, where's this been all my life? And so I decided like everything else, if shoot, this is real, I got to do it big. And I decided I'm going to be a preacher. Shocked the world. Sure. Family thought I lost my mind, lost sure. all my friends. Like, right. I had just left UGA, tore that town up. Right. I went back there to train as a campus. Culture shock. Dude, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, that's kind of like what got me. And then I ended up doing that as a career full-time ministry for 15 years. So let's talk a little bit. I know you just launched your own podcast called the Power of Peace Podcast around your Power of Peace project. And I know you're talking about addiction. Um, let's talk about addiction for a moment. All right. You know, alcoholism, drug addiction, it, it's rampant. Um, is there any uh, advantage in, in, in addiction? What opportunity did you find? What opportunity did you find in your addiction that's made you who you are today? Great question. Well, one, a lot of my compassion and empathy comes from that. Right. You know, I mean, drunk and fallen preacher, it comes back through a bunch of gangsters and convicts. That's the story. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's, I look at it like this, there's curses and there's blessings, right? And a lot of times we might label something as a curse and then just like adversity of advantage later in life, we're like, man, that's a blessing. and then in the same way, we can look at something and say, man, this is a blessing. This feels good. Later on, it's a curse. Right. And so I think there was a time where I, I fought my nature and I'm like, why you make me like this? Now, how come I can't just share a glass of wine we'll go out with the boys watching dogs right have some right. beer whatever you feel sorry for yourself kind of victim you know what i'm saying mad at my dad you know that whole deal sure years later after you know i had my last drink in 2005 hadn't been third congratulations thank you bro. I not a drink since then nope <laughs> no that's unbelievable oh, in my family line yeah I, I feel like i broke the cycle right you know what i'm saying generation 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 somebody got to break it and that's what i did um but, you know, the, what I thought was a curse, it became a great blessing because, you know, I said this in a podcast I did this past week. If you take away my addictive nature, you take away me, right? You can't have me without that nature. Sure. You get another version of me because I love hard. You know, I go after it. I get hooked on whatever makes me feel good. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. I'm passionate. I yes. feel deep. I'm, I'm just like, let's charge. I mean, all of that is wrapped up in this nature. You just got to learn how to manage it. You know? So I learned to start getting hooked on the right stuff because. Exactly. You got to gotta get addicted to the right thing. I said, bro, because nobody's going to like take away that nature so you don't drink anymore. No, you take that nature and you do find the, the superpower in it. And then you remove the things that are destructive. And so in a, a, a resounding yes, that there's a blessing in my addiction. Yeah. Oh, that's phenomenal. That's what, thank you. That's what this is all about. There you go. Finding the advantage because a lot of people focus on the adversity. They don't choose to see or find the advantage. There's always a silver lining in the cloud. We've heard that we're through the millennia. So did you go back to the church? You were the fallen drunken preacher. Did you go back to the church or were you done with the church and then the mission came in your heart to yeah preach in the prisons right i'm I, I found out that i had a gift and i believe you do every soul that comes into the world is attached to a, a, a unique gift and the purpose is to figure out that gift the the meaning is to figure out the purpose is to give it to the world well, i was giving all my stuff but it wasn't that yeah it wouldn't help a lot of people maybe entertaining some people. but you know my fall from grace was public. I mean, I've been in Atlanta, in and around Atlanta, you know, I've been around the sun 59 times. I know a lot of people. A lot from of people, Marietta. Yep, Marietta. But, you know, 30 years of that, uh, more than that, a public type of a job. And so along the way, man, it was, you know, right away, I got kind of star on the rise. They saw a young guy, smart, talented, passionate. They put right. me on track. And it turned out I was good at growing churches. I could plant a church, take over a church, grow a church, you know what I'm saying? So I, I experienced a lot of success, and that ride, you know, was fast. Hindsight, <laughs> that wasn't great for me. I needed to sit around for a minute, and I wasn't even, you know, a year sober when I went full-time. Started preaching, you know, and deep down there's this little boy still 
Sure. You know what I'm saying? And a big body that's, that's getting a lot of praise. I mean, that can be a, you know, a dangerous thing, but it's intoxicating. You know what I'm saying? You know it. When you're in front of an audience, you're connected with them. To, I mean, it's powerful. It's popping. So at about, I don't know, 35, I was in charge of almost 5,000 people, married, a couple of beautiful kids. It started getting heavy. And I started playing that game. How close can you get to the fire without getting burned? Okay, now, as a preacher. Did you start thinking about drinking? No, I'm into that drinking again. You're still okay? Okay. No, I was drinking, right? It was just the the wheels were still on. Because I, I mean, had elders watching me. They always put about two elders on me. She had a show. Right. I had all these uh, other preachers that were my ride or dies. I had a congregation under me. I mean, we were surrounded. It was hard to get too much trouble. But I still was playing with fire. I'm saying it's that kind of, I, I, I drink to, to buzz, but I wouldn't just get wasted, right? And I'd preach. And so, I, you know, I'd rationalize it, whatever. And, and I still would be blessed, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, but it turned out to be my undoing. And so I ran out of gas at the age of 40. The wheels did come off. <laughs> and I just, I, I just had nothing left in the tank. I was tired. I thought my marriage was in better shape than it was, but we were insulated, right? Right. And so I decided, man, I'm going to go do something else. I didn't get fired. They let me go. They tried to convince me to stay, and I just said, I got to go. And I walked out into a world I was not ready for. Self-selected out. Yeah, I went into the corporate world, you know what I'm saying? And I was just doing anything that was a low barrier to entry, mortgage banking, insurance, real sure. estate, whatever. I was hustling, and I, you know, my marriage was exposed. As soon as I got out from that safe, you know, the confines of that ministry, man, I just tore some stuff up, including. That's one of the toughest things I have to deal with. I have a, I have a beautiful marriage, you know, fell in love. God sent me, you know, my angel. I've got to I carry that with me. I tore up a family and my kids who are beautiful and awesome and they're 27 and 24. They went through a lot of stuff because of me. And that's probably some of the biggest things that I've had to deal with and still have to deal with. You know what I'm saying? Ongoing therapy needed or are you yeah. getting through it? Oh, yeah. I get better and better and better. But really forgiving yourself a lot of times is the hardest thing. And so, you know, yeah, that. You're, not, you're not paranoid when everybody really is talking about you. <laughs> that was a good story. Because we had this big church of 5,000 people. And you're about kid. You know, he's hanging out in clubs. You know, he's crashing cars. He's I mean, like that. After preaching for 50. But I got a case of the bumpets. I don't care. You know, I just went hard. And a reckless year. Okay, and it was a dark year. Crashed a car, middle of the night, got me on track, ended up taking my last drink, remarried. And then I'm out there for like five years, and I can't preach. And that's all I wanted to do. Sure. You know, when you... Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, in, it, it's in your DNA. Got to do it. But I, was, I felt like I was disqualified. You know what I'm saying? There ain't nobody out there looking for a drunken ball and preacher. And so I was hustling, but I was dying inside. And I prayed a prayer, it changed my life. And I said, All ears, if you ever let me preach the word again, I'll go to the ones nobody wants to go to. And I don't even know what possessed me to, to pray that prayer. But I said, I'll go to the hungry, thirsty, naked, stranger, sick, and prisoner, the least of these, the harassed and helpless. Very Christ like. Well, and I, 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 I meant that prayer, and then I got out there and started monkeying around, trying to do motivational stuff. You, you know, try to, 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 you're awesome at that, too? That thing, man. And then magic happened. You know, God brought a kid into my life that I knew when he was a little boy, and he was at a congregation I led up in Gwinnett. And I lost him, and 10 years later, he's in his mid-20s, and he's an MS-13 gang leader. On trial, uh, gang-related murder, potential death penalty, and that's when God tapped me and said, Start there. Start at the end of the line. Right. Hated, feared, forgotten. And I rode with him for about two years and really saw his life changing. And he taught me about the, the gang life. And I learned things civilians don't get to know. Right, I'm sure. And I taught him about the good life, you know, and helped him transform. And we really just, that's what sparked this thing. So in 2009, when I was invited into my first prison, I'm like, huh. So I went into. What prison was that? A State Prison. That's now, anybody that knows prisons in Georgia, they look at you like this. You know, if it are they ones, oh god, and one stretch, five bodies and six come out. I mean, this is boom on fire. Yeah. Twelve hundred men, eight hundred are affiliated. No other, not, none of it. Just war, just gang war. And God threw me in the middle of that, and I had a 
I mean, I, the ways I know it was him is I went in with fascination and curiosity. I don't know why I wasn't afraid. I just was probably because I've been dealing with MS-13, getting threats from them and stuff. And so that's when the magic happened. I started making friends. I had no idea it was going to take me around. No, I wasn't trying to go back to the church. I was mad at the church. Mm-hmm. I was mad at God. Shook my fist at him, went on my run, you know, and came back. I was like, I'm ready to talk to him. <laughs> Got that work out for you. <laughs> I was like, talk about, I always say there were cosmic curveballs swirling over our head at all times. Yeah. You talk about a cosmic curveball going from the church to the prison system. Yeah. That's, that's, the opposite end of the continuum. Yeah. So you got into the prison systems for the first time in 2009. 2010, you launched the Power of Peace Project. So something something changed in you in that prison system. You felt like you needed to, did you find your message? Did you find your calling? What was that experience that you had to say, this Power of Peace Project, Yeah. that's, that's my purpose? What happened? Well, I started making friends with guys that turned out to be powerful guys. And that's one of the gifts that I have. In the prison system or in the gangs? Okay, got it. Gangsters kind of became my... And so, you know, we all have gifts. One of my dominant gifts is relationship building. Sure. Hang out with me and try not to be my friend. You know what I'm saying? Right. You just can't. You can't hate me. And so, and now working with gangsters for so many years, I mean, I can make friends hard to get people, right? And so I just started making friends, and, and I found, this is crazy, but... I needed a safe place to be able to talk about stuff that I couldn't talk about in front of churches. I'm talking about my fall, my nature, my mistakes, my failures. They loved it. They cheered. They tear up every now and then. It's like they they became my safe place. Maximum security prison. Believe how, how ironic. Became my unbelievable. You know, became my church in yeah. other ways. I could wait to go see him every week. And I was just like doing terrible at my other jobs right. because I was just, I wanted to be in prison. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't explain it. Did you just say I wanted to be in oh prison? God, I do today, man. I got involved. I can't go back till tomorrow, but you know what I'm saying? I love it. I mean, it's where I see God working powerfully. Those guys did for me what I don't believe anybody in the free world could have done. They, they helped me not just cathartically, but I mean, I just loaded shame. I told them everything, and they loved it because they were not used to preachers coming in there no. raw, older. They're probably authentic. used to people coming in and being a little judgmental, but you're as real as it gets. Trying to save them. I came in, and I unapologetically, I say this in front of every group. I, I'm, not, I'm not here to bring God to you. I'm here to find God in you, and that's made me. That set me on this run, and yeah, it stopped. Rapport Mastery. I guess. Well, you've written six books, so I don't know when you sleep. Um, two of your most phenomenal books are Peace Behind the Wire, a Nonviolent Resolution. Uh, That's fantastic. Yep. And this one's mind-boggling, The New Convict Code, which I think is as real as any book that's ever been written, real, raw. I mean, you don't pull any punches. Tell, tell me about this book and your experience uh, living it and creating it. Yeah. What does this mean to you? It's There's so many things in that book, not just that I learned about the U.S. prison industrial complex, but those men, again, they taught me things that I couldn't learn in the church and seminary and college, or I did. And it was like, I thought I knew what respect looked like. No, they taught me what. Like, if I disrespect you today, I'm probably going to have to send you a text and say, sorry, bro, and then we're going to be cool. You disrespect somebody behind the wire, you got problem. Okay, you got to learn how to look at a man. You don't look away, you don't look too long, and you better look right. You know, it's like that. And they taught me that respect. I mean, I learned what it means to truly respect someone. And I believe that, you know, Jesus said, whatever you do for the least of these brothers of mine, you do for me. So I've done work on death road. They get my ultimate respect. Governor doesn't need any. That brother does. You see what I'm saying? They taught me about loyalty. You know what I'm saying? If I say, Glenn, I got you, bro, I'll be there, and I'm not there, you're going to hit me up and go, what happened, man? And I'm going to say, oh, sorry. In there, if you say, I got you, bro, I will be there. And if you're not, you got problems. Could that problem be death? Uh, well, yeah. I guess <laughs> that was leaking. Yeah. And so it, they, they, taught, they, didn't t- they taught me without using any words. I hung out with them so much. I've spent so much time in prison. They began to influence me. 
but not in negative. Now, some of them, I start growing my hair out. All these tats start right. coming up. We'll talk about that. Talking like a gangster. My wife is or, in my yeah. house cussing all the time. She's like, baby, what's up? Alter ego? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. But, um, and then um, integrity. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I think a whole lot of people lie all the time in the free world. Those brothers, like I was with guys on Sunday night in a Walker State prison. I told them, I said, the most honest people in my life. I'll tell those young gangsters I'm going to work with tomorrow, the youth gangs. I tell them the same thing. Y'all are some of the toughest, most courageous, uh, honest people in my life. I said, why are y'all so honest, you know, truthful with me? And they said, wow, we ain't got nothing to lie for. There's no reason to lie. And so they taught me integrity. I mean, it's so flip-flop. And I want to make sure whoever's listening and watching, whatever, I, I deeply understand the wreckage and the harm and the pain and the loss that these brothers have caused. I get that. I'm the guy that's supposed to go in there and love them until they love themselves. And really, it's about public safety. It's like, you know, Governor Kemp, he's all about trying to keep the, the streets safe. Well, guess what? 97% of those dudes come home. It's a matter of what state are they going to come back in. Right. Are they going to come back to your neighborhood and be, you know what I'm saying? Right. And so it's motivated by really, really trying to change things that'll help people and keep kids off the streets. But I know a lot of times people have a hard time, but I'm helping people that have done some horrible things. Yeah. You're a massive change agent. Try him. So horrible people. You've been in the toughest prisons in the world. Crips, Bloods, MS-13. Peel the layers of the onion back. What's that like? What's And when you go into these environments, what's your fear level? I mean, I know you're a very confident man, but still, you're a human, Kit. You walk into a place like that, Mexico or not even all over the world, how do you manage your emotions and your fear when you go into the pit? If you, I can't explain it other than I think he absolutely called me, and I go in with a, a sense of fascination and curiosity, and I don't know why I trust this guy. You know, I, I teach them all the time. You know how you can trust somebody? Trust them. You'll find out. I trust them. I mean, I walked into a Honduran prison. I did a seven prison tour in Honduras. Okay, that's a beast. That's the home of MS-13, correct? El Salvador, Guatemala, right. Paris, right down in there. And so, you know, these prisons are a trip. Now, beautiful people in those countries, beautiful countries, but, you know, a lot of problems because of these gangs. And, and so anyway, they just have huge big old walls with guys with M16 standing on the top, they got no officers or guards on the inside. <laughs> so I walk in there and I'm like, all right, now what do we do next? And they say, passport, boom. And then another door opens and I go through it and there's a brother, you know, just a brother, prisoner, and he's my guide and my interpreter. And it's like, all right, let's go. And it's a fascinating city. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. It's just like, it looks like this sprawling village and there's guys. And you don't have family to take care of you. You don't eat. They don't give you clothes. They don't give you shoes. You've got to find your place to stay. I mean, this is third world prison. But here's something I've found around the world, and it hasn't failed yet. There might be some places where it wouldn't work. I don't know. But there's this code. And if somebody from the free world is coming in to try to do good and help you, they're untouchable. Like if somebody that's touched, good. Oh yeah. Okay, that's good. I didn't know that. I rely on that because if if I get touched, they're in huge trouble. I mean, they'll get hurt bad if they were to touch somebody like me. That's good. Yeah, I began to rely on that, and then I always find the most influential guy in the in the joint, and I've I become his friend. Yes. You know what I'm saying? No surprise there. That's awesome. So that co- favorite that code is uh, it's like an it's an insurance policy on your life. It is, and that you know the new convict code. What I did is I got to where I understood. The guys never believe me. They're like, you did time. I'm like, I did not. I got arrested a handful right. of times being a knucklehead, but I never had changed my clothes. And they said, you're a lot. No way you could know us like you wow. did. That's, and no, that's a hell of a compliment. It really is. Wow. They said that about Johnny Cash because they, lo- they he loved them so much that they said he's one of us. Yep, exactly. And I love them like that. You know, but, but it's somewhere along the line, you know, you, you become kind of a made guy and they begin to protect yeah. you and the word. Good analogy. Out. And so the new convict code takes their code and then uses it 
in a way that helps them learn to be honorable and noble and not give up their code because you can't. A, a prison will not run right without that code, convict code, G code. And so the prisons run the street. <laughs> now that's, I mean, think about that's it. That's kind of hard to wrap your mind around, but I've, you know, I've heard that. Expand, okay. expand upon that for a minute. I mean, How the hell does that work? You've got the most influential guys on the street. They're going in there and doing long bids. You know what I'm saying? Kids lining up to get it's just a, it's a rite of passage, but now they're throwing mountains. Of but there's a code. Like, for instance, if, if you're in a cell, it's 100 degrees in the summertime in your cell. Imagine that. And so you've got to get a fan. Now, you can go and you can buy a fan. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's, you can buy things, commissary, and then you've got hustlers. And let's say that somebody puts some money in your books, you go buy a fan. Now, that thing is coveted, okay? So you're in there, and you go to chow, whatever it is. Somebody comes in, takes your fan. You come back, fan's gone. Okay, convict code says, uh-uh, no stealing. The dorm will get you your fan back. They'll deal with that brother because they can't have Robin in the cells, can't do it. And so, but here's the, here's the flip side. If you're in your cell and a brother wants your fan and he comes in and says, I'm going to take that fan, you have the right to fight for it. If you lose, you lose your fan. That's the convict code. Feel me? And there's a lot of things like that that just they're the rules of the game, and you learn them by just being there, no matter whether you want to play or not. <laughs> it, you're you're just thrown in the fire. There's there's not a book on it. You you learn it by learning it. That's it by living it. So um, I got to hear about Roots, your international traveling companion, and I got to you tell us about your tats because you didn't have those at UGA, and I know they tell an incredible story. So yeah, they, Roots, that's <laughs> Yeah, so Roots, you know, he's my partner. If, I, if I'm in a prison, I got Roots. If I'm at school, if I'm in the courts, if I'm in the jails, if I'm in a corporate gig yesterday, I got Roots. Okay. And he's he's become a symbolic of a number of things. The, the, the main one is potential. You know, the potential is what could be but has not been. Okay. You know what I'm saying? There's a See, there was a you in a, inside of you that you did not meet until the major storm. Then you met yeah. a guy that was hiding inside, right? Right. And it, it's like that. Okay, so, you know, I'll hold him up and I'll say, what's his name? They yell, Roots. And I say, what's he mean? And they yell, Potential. And I was like, but, but why is because of the story. I hold him up. Yes, Dad, I did it again. I said, what is this? And they're like, staff, a uh, walking stick, a cane, a rod. Nobody has ever said a branch, which is what it is. Okay. It's a broken, fallen branch. Okay. I know where it was born because where? it was downtown Atlanta, right by the old, uh, the amphitheater, tough little area called Lakewood. Yep. We were doing uh, youth gang intervention, prevention down there too. And so this, this cool young brother would always come up and he was kind of Jamaican, a little smaller than me, brother more color than me and younger than me. And he would help. And he just, he, he became my friend. And turned out Roots lives on the streets. At that time, he did. Homeless brother. You wouldn't know it. He's just going through, you know, substance abuse, a lot of us. And so, but he was such a servant. And he'd always come to me and be like, brother kid, you need a stick. And I'd be like, why? He said, you need protection down these streets. And I was like, how do I get one? And so this was his hustle. So he, the artist, man, he would, he would find the right instrument and he would create something special. So, so he created that, not you. Exactly. Okay. And his name is Oh, that's great. Well, when was Roots born? 2013. Okay. He's 10. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it was, you know, I lost Roots. He moved on and he ended up uh, dying. He was, he was struck right. by a drunk driver while he was on his scooter. Interestingly, the day he was struck, December 27th, 2020, December 27th is my sobriety date, you know, in 2005. So we're forever connected. Brother. But he... Those years that I lost him, <laughs> this this broken branch went on a world tour. I mean, it's been in front of tens of thousands now, and he never got to see it. Oh, okay. and if anybody goes to my Facebook page and go to albums, go to cover, and I, there's a thousand pictures of me with different kids, com. Yes, there are. Corporate, yes, with Roots. Yeah. KSU texted me basketball program. Is Roots available on March 7th? Oh, that's great. They ain't me. I can't Roots. <laughs> they, they want him on the bed. Yeah. The Joker's got two state championship rings. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, that I own because the kids, they 
they touch him coming out of the, they want him on the, oh, what he stands for is, is everything. It's, a, it's, it's who you could be, but here's why. Nobody saw it. They saw a broken branch, which is trash. Fell from the ground, storm, boom, becomes trash, kick side, burn it. Not Roots. Roots saw the potential of what that branch could be. What a powerful metaphor for life. That's it. And so if we see people that way, I'm going to see you the way I want you to. Trust you until you give me a reason. Uh, so then I'll probably trust you. <laughs> yeah. So powerful. Wow. I love that. Love that. Now the, the ink, you know, I was, I was. <laughs> Where did you start? Right there. Now I had a couple little ones on my back, but, um, but right there, it's a broken peace sign with a 40 on it. And that was to honor the brothers in my very first prison at Hayes. And so I did that for them. And I told my wife, it's the only one, baby. <laughs> oh my gosh. And then. It just got to be this movement. So, you know, I, I took it from Georgia to Michigan. Those guys changed my life. So I put Mighty Cannabis. And then I took it by to, to over to Ohio, and those brothers went on my Marion Correctional. And it kind of became my thing. It's like, <clears throat> if you change my life, you'll go on the story. And so there's, there's different peacemakers and prisons and schools and it's a story. And some people were like, how long did it take to do that sleeve? In like 10 years. Because it's one little, it's, a, it's over 100 tattoos that were put on one at a time, only as the story developed. And so now it spread to the other arm. And like this juvenile prison that I'm working in now, Eastman, because I told these tough little young gangsters, I said, change my life and I'll put you on my arm. They're like, yeah. So I come back and. So that's what that's it, commitment. But she gonna cut me off. With it. I can't keep going. After I was gonna this. say, if you live with nine or hundred, they're going down your legs, brother. <laughs> yeah, I can't do it. So anyway, that's that's the story. That's, that's right. and it's connected me with people. It's crazy. You know, the stories are too long. But I had to meet a cartel soldier that that had power. Or his his turf was toughest part. T one. T one is on fire. Cartel war. Nobody looks like me. Nobody of our brothers of color, you know, our African American brothers, nobody down there. So, because it's just 25 homicides, 2,500 homicides oh. a year. Atlanta, three times the size, has 300. Okay. And those are the ones we That's know a about. Killing zone. Yeah. So, we're having this event down there, and I got to meet with this guy, Chava, to make sure he can give us protection. And so, we meet, and it was, it's the tattoo. I reached out my hand. I said, Sir, hey, 25 kill. And he looked down and he saw pause. Rear means peace in his language. Okay. He's like, I said, I'm a peacemaker, man. Then I asked him about his tattoo, Lupita. I said, who's that? And he went, fine girl sitting over by this wall. We connected on the death row in, in, uh, in Angola. Right. And uh, I, I put my hand through the death row bars and this beautiful Muslim brother, young brother, we, we grasp and he sees out of all these tattoos, he sees Salam. In Arabic, he goes, why you got that? I said, because I come in peace. Asalaamu Alaikum. Mm -hmm. He's like, see all the breath. Nobody noticed his career. <laughs> and we met. I, I always use humor. Because these guys aren't used to free war guys coming in and just cutting up. You know what I'm saying? Right. So he had, a picture, imagine. he had a picture of Kim Kardashian on his, it was his prized possession. <laughs> and so I walk up, it's just me. And I'm looking at him. I look at it. And I say, I got some bad news, dog. And he's like, what? I said. Kim don't look like that anymore. And, and he's like, his baseballs. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean? I said, well, she's pregnant. She's about to give birth. You know, you gain a lot of weight when you get pregnant. And he's all sad. And then he looks up at me and he goes, she's still fine though, ain't she? I was like, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Then the tattoo gets us talking. We relate and I make a friend. So tattoo's a beast. You can find yourself in the story. So. I admire you. Admire your total commitment to your cause. It's phenomenal. What is, um, I think you got a potential movie, documentary coming out. I know you're fired up and you should be. What does the future hold for Kit Cummings and the Power Peace Project? What can you share? Yeah, this, um, I can share them under contract, okay. you know, with a group um, actually out of London that does documentaries. And, um, you know, those, these things take a minute, but make a documentary. I believe we're going to start filming, uh, shooting at the end of this year. And so it would be a documentary series. Imagine this. True crime is what everybody's watching. Right? Sure. Netflix, whatever. True crime stories are gritty, and the, the limited series is, is hot because you can tell a big story. But at the end of it, it they just kind of wrap it up and say, you did it. <laughs> you know, and you're right. like fascinated. 
get to see the train wreck, the darkness behind the curtain. Well, this story, and I've known it for a minute, this story is one that would be not just entertaining, but would give people hope because it's got sexy, gangster, dark behind the wire on the streets, but then it's got redemption and hope. I've never seen anything like that. So somebody caught the vision for that. And so I, I signed well, right about the same time, another group approached me out of LA and but they want to do a narrative, like a dramatic narrative. And they want to do a series too. And now now Are you involved? Do you get to be in it? <laughs> or you, cameo. Okay. And they also let you be like a consulting producer. So you get producing right. credits or whatever. But it, it's a very weird feeling. So I don't know that those things take up. So I don't know where Yeah, it's I'm it's humbling. It feels weird. You know what I'm saying? Because you're sitting in these meetings and talking about this story that, you know, so surreal a little bit. Yeah. It's something I never, I never dreamed of it. There's, you know, a, a passage says he is able to do measurably more than all we ask or imagine. And I'm like going back to that first prayer and saying, if you ever let me preach again, I just go to some guys nobody wants to go to. I didn't have any of this on my books or films or world tours. I mean, it was like, I, I just wanted to pray. How could you have it on your radar? Right. Things were happening you couldn't imagine. And it was my failure. I built my career on my worst failure. Oh, I love it. Now, that's your wheelhouse. Uh, absolutely. Well, yours wasn't failure. It was adversity. It was yes. a storm, right? Yes, a massive, perfect storm. So, kid, okay, this has been phenomenal. Um, love you, brother. Respect you. Always been in your court. I probably like your posts as much as anybody on earth. Um, so let's. Let's put a bow on this. Just wrap it up. In, in, in your mind, what does advantage of adversity mean to you? I think they're, they're painful, but the storms are the good stuff. And, and there's a, I couldn't do the work that I do. It's not like, a, oh, he's a free world dude that cares about the prisoners. If you don't got any story, if you don't got any pain, that's what moves them is the pain. Yes. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's what they can identify. And I look back at my, my life from addiction, you know, throughout my life, you know, suicide in my family, some abuse as a child, not from my family, but somebody else, you know, my own craziness and getting locked up and then the ministry and then divorce and then bankruptcy and rehab. And I just, I messed everything up. You know what I'm saying? I'm that guy. You're a self-confessed knucklehead. Oh, big time. The chief love, knucklehead, bro. Chief knucklehead. And it's like, but without that, and I, I, I don't like the, the wreckage I caused. I, you know, I, if I could take that back. Sure. But the storms, they, they, without them, you don't have me. You know what I'm saying? And so that's the, and I'll, I'll close with this. This is how hard these guys love. Our oldest son was a soldier. He's four combat troopers, and now he's he's retired and family, grandkid for us and everything. But anyway, he got hurt one of his home leaves when he was fighting in Iraq, and he got into a fight with somebody. He was trying to defend him. He kicked this guy's butt. The guy came back and got into it again with a knife and cut him, oh. cut him all up. I don't know how he survived. He's got a scar across his face. So like I always do, I go back to my guys. This is my safe place. You know, I go and I share my pain. So I'm saying, man, this happened. There was this weird vibe in the room because them were there for violent crimes. I'm sitting here crying in front of them. Mine got hurt. And I'm just getting it out. And all of a sudden in the back of the guy goes, what's his name? And I'm like, Justin, our son? He goes, no, the other dude, what's his name? And I said, Michael. And then another dude said, what's his last name? And I'm like, I wanted to say it. I said, I can't say you, bro. And then they all start shouting, tell us his name, bro. And I said, I can't, man. And then this brother says, he goes, don't worry. We won't kill him. We'll just touch him. And I was like, these guys would not just die for me, they'll kill for me. And I thought, that is, is powerful. So they're ride or die. So I want to go to all of them. Netflix, 10 toughest prisons of the world. I've been in half of them. I want to go to the other half. <laughs> yeah. Wow. This is, this is rich, man. I appreciate you. And appreciate you. Uh, you said you're in my corner, bro. I'm in yours. I mean, what you're doing is admirable, inspiring. You know, people need this, especially now. So thank you for looking. Love you. Love you, love you.
Let everybody know, let our viewers know where they can contact you if they want you for anything. Yeah, yeah. KitCummings.com, KitCummings.com, PowerOfPeaceProject.com, or just put my name or Power Peace Project in there. Power Peace Podcast, you know, go to my YouTube. My my website would love we, addiction, mental health, incarceration. We're trying to take the stigma away and the shame away from things that people are dealing with. Love you, brother. Appreciate you. This is a wrap on another fantastic podcast, The Advantage of Adversity, uh, filming here at Mesmerize Media Studio in North Atlanta. Have a phenomenal day. Never forget to find the opportunity. Adversity. Adversity.